You have a TV? No. I just like to read the TV guide. Read the TV guide. You don't need a TV. Television addict! Television addict! Television addict! Ah. Welcome, hello, it's Ken Reed, it's TV Guidance Counselor. Yet another special edition episode, a little mini episode today. As I mentioned earlier in the month, it is uh, the holiday season. Or, or, you know, if you're an atheist like I am, it's uh, culturally a holiday season. I don't, I don't want to get into that. But hey, I'm giving to you with more episodes this month. And this episode is a really fun conversation I had with Molly Crabapple. If you're not familiar with Molly, you should get familiar with her. Uh, she's an excellent, excellent writer, writes for Vice, has a brand new memoir out called Drawing Blood. That's very, very good. Uh, in addition to being a great writer, she is also an amazing illustrator, which uh, frankly isn't fair that she can be be both of those things. And I'm neither of those. But uh, this isn't about me, uh, although what kind of is because it's my show but anyway molly very very funny interesting smart really like talking to her she was coming through town on a little book tour and i thought you know let me see if i can grab some of her time she was very busy so i managed to get a half an hour which is uh very gracious of her and i want to thank her again for sitting down and talking to me it was really fun we we recorded in a um weird little alcove in the uh paramount theater in boston which is kind of an old vaudeville theater so it was it was pretty cool and i want to thank former guest of the show mr ryan Ryan Walsh for, for helping us grab that space. Ryan's in the amazing band Hallelujah the Hills. We have a new record coming out and Ryan just got a book deal as well. So I very much look forward to his book. But for the book at hand is uh, Molly Crabapple's Drawing Blood, her new memoir. Definitely pick it up. You will enjoy it. I did very much. I first became aware of her work uh, when she put out uh, A Week in Hell, which is a really interesting project. She basically stayed in a, in a motel room for a week and, and, and drew over all over all the walls and the book is uh, her illustrations from that week it's it's very very cool i i recommend picking it up so please sit back relax and enjoy today's special bonus mini episode of tv guidance counselor with my guest molly crap tv is my friend and it has been always there for me in time with me is molly crap up how are you sir sir i said sir <laughs> I'm good. Yeah. I'm I'm slightly exhausted and I, I sympathize with you because I feel like I've also been saying the wrong word all day and yeah. all of the last uh, week and a half. This is like your third interview today or something like this that. This is only my second interview today, okay. but I also did a I also did a signing, so it's a light day. Yeah, but I'm such like an introvert and I always hide in my burrow so much. This is a lot of social interaction yeah. for me. You're gonna need like like a year of just like hermitness to just make up for it after exactly you're gonna find me in the corner with i'll have a stick if anyone comes near me to ask how i am i'm gonna hit them with the stick you'll this need is to the go, problem you'll need to go into some kind of stasis yeah like you're traveling to mars or something and then they'll just like on defrost you and it, exactly exactly so you you grew up in long island I think? long island and far Rockaway, yeah okay so when you were growing up um did you go into manhattan a lot or were, were constantly okay. oh god i mean if you're near a train station yeah from the time you were 14 you're sneaking into manhattan and I was always going there, um, sometimes for sort of nerdy purposes, like hanging out at the Strand, uh, sometimes to shoplift art books from Barnes and Noble. Well, and at least it was a corporate company. It was, it yeah. was a corporate company. I was actually, I was a little punk kid, so I was yeah. pretty self-righteous about not stealing from indies. The mom and pops. Yeah, yeah. No, I was, as a 14-year-old, uh, Barnes and Noble. <laughs> or else like to flirt with punk boys on St. Mark's and stuff. But yeah, I, I, I spent a lot of time sneaking into New York. So would you go to like CBs and stuff? Because that closed in what, 96, 97? You know, I didn't go to CBs. I wasn't cool enough to actually go to nightclubs. Okay. Sometimes I, I, I feel like there was this level of just extreme social awkwardness that yeah. prevented me from experiencing all these things I knew about, like the limelight, but I just... I wasn't cool enough, man. You feel like you couldn't talk your way in there? Yeah, I couldn't talk. That was more to the point. Like, I had all the weirdo hair and everything that right. probably would have gotten me in, but I just didn't know how to make words and speak to other humans. Yeah. No, I completely uh, can identify with that. As I was I was sort of lucky in that I went through a growth spurt when I was 13 and basically been this height, so people just let me in. <laughs> nice, nice. So I would hang nice. out at the, at the Rat, which was kind of our version of, of CBGBs Sweet. and that and stuff. But I, I never drank, never did any drugs or anything, but the, the kids who I hung out with were like, oh, Ken can get in the bar. He doesn't even drink you appreciate it. I'm like, I just want to go see the band play. But yeah, I would sit in the corner. There, everyone was like, "This is our scene, and we're a, a part of something for the first time." And I'm just like, "I'll be in the corner. Don't, uh, don't speak to me. I'm, I don't know what to do." Exactly. Like I worship you from afar, but I'm not 
human enough to participate in what you're doing. So how did you first come aware that you liked that kind of stuff? Like I, for, for example, I remember seeing this show Night Flight, which showed like stuff about John Waters and punk rock and then like the young ones on MTV. When I first saw The Damned, I was like, oh, that's what I like. I didn't know this, but now I like it. How did you sort of discover that you, that was the thing you liked? Oh God, there was this amazing uh, compendium of zines that was called Fact Sheet 5. Oh yeah, I, used, I had a subscription. I love Fact Sheet 5. And I found uh, an issue of Fact Sheet 5, I think in a bookstore and I bought it. And I wrote to every single zine that was free. And then I started reading Maximum Rock and Roll. Yep. And I have never been super educated about music, but I love the columns of Maximum Rock and Roll. Mm -hmm. like George Tab, Reverend yeah, Norb. Yeah, 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 yeah. The guy who's in Mongolia, do you remember? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And there was like a dominatrix. She had a column and... Oh, it was so good. Nick and Fit. I think he was a Boston guy. Yeah. It was, it was the best. And then I would like write to anarchist prisoners that were in the back of maximum rock and roll. Remember they had their pen pal section yep. and stuff. Mumia. That was yeah. a real hover. Yeah. Dude, totally, totally. And I just sort of fr from there. Right. I mean that, yeah, that's uh pretty much aside from the television influence and the fact that we had good college radio, you basically just described the same thing. Cause are you, do you have siblings? No, I don't have siblings. Okay. So you're just the only child. So you didn't even have like the cool older sibling who could no, like, introduce no. you to that world. Um, as I did not either. So maximum rock and roll for people that don't know, I, I've mentioned it on the show a bunch of times, but it was, was like the major national punk scene based out of California. Um, it was very California centric. We had a few up here in Boston, one called Suburban Voice. Weirdly, I can't think of like a New York punk scene though, aside from the original punk yeah, in the seventies, there wasn't really one in our, in the nineties. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I think it was, is maximum rock and roll. I was, my mom would steal stamps for me to get zines from her job. And oh I would, my God. I remember maximum rock and roll taught you how to steam the, them off I, envelopes. Yeah. Yeah. And putting glue over it so <laughs> yes, the other person could wipe it off. Yes. Yeah. I would do that all the time. <laughs> oh God. We, we were like, the, we were like the pettiest and most inefficient criminals. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh man. A 25 cents. I remember a trick <laughs> that I learned in maximum rock and roll that still worked until like years ago was if you dialed an 800 number. Number. Did you ever did you ever do this one? You didn't have any money to make a phone call, so you dial an eight hundred number. If they hang up on you, you don't hang up, and then you can dial any number and it charges oh, it to fuck. them. I didn't know about that, but I definitely knew about having people call you at your payphone. And also, um, I always wanted to do the thing where you um would you know audio tape the Ma Bell sounds, yes. and then you could make then you can make the phone calls. Yeah. Oh, there was, I remember seeing on TV as a kid. I used to watch like Twenty Twenty and all those gadget shows, and someone was trying to sell a thing so kids didn't get lost. Where it was a little recording they wore around their neck oh, of God. their phone number. Oh kids God. Kids don't remember their phone number. Yeah. So they could just hold and it had a quarter in it, I think too. <laughs> so they could just hold it up to a phone and press the button, and then it would dial their home, which yeah. is kind of a good idea, although it didn't really take off. Um, so were you watching any television at that time? Because so much stuff was set in New York. I. I didn't I didn't go to New York, I think, till I was like 15, and so I had this weird night court view of it. <laughs> oh, man. Well, I remember I watched some of Dawson's Creek the first okay. season because they had the bad girl from New York, yep. Jen, I believe her name yep. was. And Michelle Williams, I think, was Jen. Yep. Yeah, Michelle Williams. Oh, so many, so many careers, for better or worse, started on that show. And I really was angry at it at the time because I was like, why is she being punished by going to this this tiny right. place and being and being judged? Like, what is so bad about New York that like just the fact that a woman or a girl is from there means that she has to be exiled? Right. And they're always like, oh, she's got like loose New York morals. <laughs> that show was always like the whole first season. Yeah, it was all, like, yeah, it was all about all about uh, you know how terrible terrible girls like me are. I guess. But you would still watch it and be like, just just to make yourself kind of angry about it. Yeah, yeah. yeah and the also, outrage. Yeah, and why else did I watch it? I think because there's that girl, the Katie Holmes character. Yeah. She was an artist. Yes. Yeah. Well, everyone on that show was so angsty and artsy. Yeah, yeah. And Dawson was, was a filmmaker and oh, all that stuff. Oh, God. And I remember that like that generation. Like It seemed like all of the TV shows were about these like angsty, sort of alienated white kids, really. Yeah. Oh, totally. I mean, I felt like all those shows were people in their mid-20s. What is that? There's a French term like the spirit de escalor or whatever, like the things they wish they said when they were a teenager. Yeah, exactly. Now Twitter lets you do that. You just yeah. take all of the lines you wish you said to a specific person and just inflict them on the general public. Yeah. Well, they did it with like billion dollars of uh, <laughs> movies and television studio money. And then we see we see how we see how the, how, the, how the internet has destroyed the value of our labor. I feel like people our age had a lot more hate watching. Like there were just like th things that were aimed at you and you're like, I'm going to watch this just to prove to myself that I hate it. <laughs> oh man. Especially after school specials. And then there was that whole genre of, uh, 
sort of informational films that they would show, show students. I remember they were always making us watch uh, films telling us not to be anorexic. Yes. And they were so counterproductive because I, I do not have an eating disordered bone in my body. I, I you know, but they really like made anorexia look great. And it's they like, give you ideas. It's yeah, like, you can yeah. do that. Yeah. Yeah. Like, wow. You know, if I, I would be the best ballerina, if I was an anorexic, I remember we had, we had a, a dare, a dare was, I don't know if dare was a national program or a Massachusetts program. No, no, they had it. They had it too. Okay. And it, we had a, a dare cop come in and he pulled out this suitcase filled with like every drug. on earth. <laughs> he was like, you know what this guy, and it's like every single drug ever. And then he goes, he goes, you know, and we're like, okay, these look like drugs. And he pulls out a jar of peanut butter that he had in there with drugs. And he's like, you guys know what this is, right? And we're like, yeah, it's peanut butter. And he, and he opens it and it's natural peanut butter. So it has the oil on the top. Yeah. He goes, kids will take this oil. They'll put it in a needle, shoot it in their arm, and then they die. <laughs> and I was like, first of all, why? I don't think anyone in this room would that ever would have occurred. Why would you do that? I don't know why you would have told us that. It's very weird. <laughs> it's like this. I, I can just imagine this. He's like pulling out like this is caught from Yemen. Uh, yeah. Do you kid, you kids stay yeah. away from this too? Like every drug in the world. Kids smoke this it's called black tar heroin. <laughs> they have a great time and then they die. <laughs> they go down to four one one Main Street and they buy it from Rudy for forty one dollars. Like yeah, it was very informational that I just didn't understand. Yeah, yeah. The, the anorexia specials and the drug specials were were all uh, extremely technical. Yes. Yeah. And I here's the thing that I don't know if you had this experience as well where I in hindsight I actually appreciate the MTV of the 90s especially compared to the way it is now but like 120 minutes and all these shows like even alternative nation and I got exposed to all these amazing bands and all this cool stuff that I probably wouldn't have seen otherwise yeah but at the time I had to be like this is bullshit I mean I liked a lot of 90s MTV stuff too and yeah especially you you look at how like women were allowed to look on music videos and you're just like man, you could just be like a fucking rocker and you didn't have oh, to yeah. be glam. Like you could just be, be good. And also, oh my God, Aeon Flux and the Max. Yes. And all, the, all, the, all those all, basically like weird fucked up um, sort oh, yeah. of like BDSM-y alternative comic books made into animations. I love that stuff. Well, Liquid Television in general yeah. that, that a lot of stuff came from would have stuff like Charles Burns doing Dog Boy on that. I'm like, all these underground comic artists that are just, you know, on five nights a week on MTV was... Again, at the time, I don't think I appreciated it as much as that. And like now, I'm like, well, how did that happen? That Viacom was like, yeah, whatever. I guess they they just didn't know. I mean, even things like I remember how they used to have the MTV logo drawn in all these weird ways. Yeah. As an illustrator, that's the sort of stuff that burned into my eyes at the time. Oh, that was oh, what an era! And they would buy those little shorts from like art students, at, really like, NYU and stuff. And so they would, and you could send them little films. And a lot of those were just just kids in art school that sent them those and that's they so cool. that's so cool i and then like fucking daria oh yeah so good so 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 much then of course i'm probably like i i haven't seen this stuff in a really long time and i have found that thing i'm sure you found it too where when you remember this like classic thing from your youth and then you watch it again you you sort of look back in horror yeah like what was i thinking like this or especially something that you're like oh maybe it was so deep that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It's a bit like rereading a teenage diary sometimes. Oh, I had to do that for my memoir. And it, well, sometimes you realize quite vividly why you had no friends. Yes. Yeah. No, I, uh, I, I <laughs> there's like some parts of my te later teenage years when I was in a band and stuff that I'm still like, oh, I must have been the worst. Just like the worst person to have to talk to. I was just miserable all the time. <laughs> and then like people would be like, oh, great show. And I'd be like, oh, it's terrible. <laughs> and they'd just be like, thank you. could have just said thank you. It's, it's, do you find yourself now, like, I imagine you probably attract a lot of, like, teenage, like, angsty teens who, who sort of identify with the, your, your, um, experience as a teen. I and, do. And you kind of want to tell them, like, hey, most of this stuff's not going to matter. I, what I always tell people is, actually, your angst as a teen, it's totally legitimate. Childhood yeah. sucks. I mean, you, you have no rights. I mean, obvi obviously, you have angst. Um, but if you can just survive this, yeah, you can you can leave all this fuckery behind. Yeah, and it's so because I remember people saying that to me, and I'm sure people said it to you, and you're like, you don't understand. And so I never want to say that to people where I'm like, just stick stick it out, man. It's gonna it's gonna totally get be it'll be fine, and the lots of stuff seems like a big deal won't be. But it's it's so minimizing, and there's no way to convey that to them without sounding like a jerk. I mean, I think the only thing is to be like, I realize exactly how hideous this is, and sometimes you just have to endure. Yeah, yeah. Because the thing is, the worst thing is those fuckers that tell kids uh, this is the best time of your life. Oh, yeah. Uh, could, could you imagine that? Like, yeah, like 
fucking best time of your yeah. life. I, the, the fact that it would just get worse from that. Oh right. dear God. It's like being in an iron lung and they're like, this is the best you're going to feel, man. <laughs> it, I wish I was in that lung laying down all day, <laughs> reading newspapers. It's great. Yeah. Like, because, because after the iron lung time, then they cut off your legs. Yeah. <laughs> then you got, then you got one lung and it's just terrible. It's getting worse. I, uh, I really weirdly found a lot of, um, sort of not satisfaction, but like, uh, like a sense of place reading like sassy. You like sassy? Oh my God. I had a subscription that I would buy my sister every year for. Oh, that's so cool. And they had the boy version dirt, but it only lasted like two issues. Dirk? Dirt. Dirt? Yeah. Like, 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 like dirtbag skater boys? Exactly. Yeah. And it was like the male version of sassy, but it was a huge failure. But that magazine was very sort of gender neutral weirdly. And because it was ostensibly aimed at girls would talk more about like hey stuff sucks yeah instead of just being like guitars and skate like it wasn't like thrasher you <laughs> yeah, know, which yeah. is the only other thing and that sort of really was a moment like 93 94 and like my so-called life and all these shows where they were i think it addressed that stuff respectfully were you into that kind of stuff as well i was so i was born in 83 so i feel like I like caught the very tail end of my so-called life before right. it was canceled. Like I, I missed Sassy just. Yeah. But you know, even Seventeen magazine and like the most corporate conformist things in that era, like were pre they had some pretty alt stuff in them. Oh, absolutely. It was like I remember. Uh, it would I I told the story on stage before, but I I spent I unlocked the secret of the embarrassing stories they have in there. Which really, is which was that three components. It has to involve. Uh, it has to happen in front of your your crush or your friend's dad. It has to have involved nudity and or your period. And if you're branded with a nickname at the end, like it's guaranteed in there. Yeah. So this is how bored I was. I used to write letters for everything. I just wrote them all. I would write these fake um, <laughs> embarrassing stories and mail them to like every 17. Did you, did you ever get one in? I got one in. And it was about uh, we were having chicken fights in the pool. And I got uh, paired up with my crush. And I got my period. And someone said <laughs> the back of his neck was bleeding. And then everyone called me chicken period. And then they called me chickpea. And it was in there. But. I was reading a lot of them yeah. and a lot of the st articles they had was like, I'm 17 and I have AIDS and I got it from a blood transfusion or like I'm a pregnant teen and like a respectful, interested, not like teen mom on MTV. You know? Yeah. And it, it, looking back again, it's kind of crazy that that stuff was in anything. I mean, that stuff now, like, of course, is like the currency of so many women's sites. I guess on the flip side, and this is like an adult thing, not like a teen thing. The fact that like personal essays are so emphasized in women's media means that like they just don't cover universal stuff in women's media. Like, yeah. like Esquire will, will publish shit about everything, right? Um, and there's just not the same sort of thing. It's in, in, in a lot of women's stuff. It's like men get to have the world and women get to have like the women's part. Yeah. It's like men can only do like gonzo journalism yeah. and women have to like talk about how someone they know doing gonzo journalism affected them. Yeah. About how, the, <laughs> about how the gonzo journalist dude that they knew, um, Broke their heart. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's it's silly. I mean, I, I feel like we should both be able to do personal stuff and also big stuff. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I, I mean, and that sort of gets into some stuff we were talking a little bit before we started recording was, you know, you do a, a lot of these stories for Vice and, and these, for lack of a better term, like political stuff, that kind of stuff that it sounds like you, you want to read and want to see. And weirdly sort of things like mtv news used to do things like that and there was sort of a mass broadcast media that would cover that sort of stuff even linda ellerby on nickelodeon who did nick news for kids would cover that kind of stuff and it seems like now there's not a mass media that does it you have to go to places like vice that you are well, vice like. has a deal with hbo yes but even there it's um you know I, it's a pay I, d I don't actually okay this is this is where i confess i haven't watched tv in fuck um, I haven't watched TV in 16 years. So, At all, nothing. I mean, I think I've probably like in hotel rooms, I've probably watched like episodes of something or other. Right. And, um, I, but I don't even think I've seen like full episodes. It's not a puritanistic thing. I'm just, I, I think I'm maybe too ADD for it or something. Right. Or like, just busy or like, I think yeah. it's one of those things that once you stop, it's hard to get back. Especially maybe? like we don't have a TV and the only place to watch TV shows would be on this couch. It's kind of uncomfortable. Right. Right. So it just it, that, like at a weird angle with the, with the computer. So I think maybe that that's why I don't do it. It's no, no judgment on it. I know amazing, like ama amazing art, art is being done on TV right Are now. Are you watching movies and stuff or just? I, some, sometimes I do. Sometimes I watch movies, but even, even that, I mean, I don't, I, that that just doesn't tend to be like my thing. I think probably because of the uncomfortable couch situation right. plays into it. So you it. need a new couch, is what you're saying? 
or or I, I or I have or I you know get my media like through, through books or something. Right, right, right. When you were first interested in like illustration stuff, was I, I know here we had like weirdly I remember in the eighties and early nineties there was a ton of like instructional drawing shows for kids like we yeah. had a guy named captain bob who every saturday he was a sea captain would draw animals and show you how to do it and pbs had tons of that really stuff. i didn't know this no yeah. i i had these amazing like books for kids that taught you how to draw and some of them were really useful like i would give them to art students now i still remember this one book it taught you how to like draw cubes and cylinders and then build whole complicated forms through drawing that and yeah. folds and stuff and i still think about stuff that way now there was a there was a guy who he may have written that book his name was mark something and he wrote this thing called like Imagination Station. And he had this show where it was like a kid sci-fi show where he was like Captain Drawing, but would be like foreshortening and, and all this stuff. This like sounds that. like him. This sounds like him. Yeah, he had a mustache. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. yeah, yeah. That was the best. I love that book. I there are so many art students that can't draw shit now. And like I want to give them all that book. Yeah, his show was really cool. He had this big mural that every day he'd teach you a lesson and then he'd add to the mural. It was like this alien city. Yeah, that, that, that. Forbidden City, that's what it was oh called. Oh my God, this, Secret City. this is so cool. I, you're like restoring my childhood to me. I, I completely forgot what this was, but I just remembered I loved that book so much. Yeah. Secret City, I think. And, and they're on YouTube if you, uh, you know, on the computer, if you get a comfortable chair, <laughs> you could sit and check that out again. But yeah, I think that that sort of stuff that you stumble on as a kid, and I think we came of age in a, in a time when it was a lot of like, kids can do anything, kind of kid yeah, power yeah. stuff like Nickelodeon was doing for it got completely corporate was, was pretty great in that it was it was mass media it was you could stumble on it i guess that's that, that's the point i'm making it's is it do you think it's harder to stumble on things now i mean yes and no i mean when one of the dangers of algorithms right is that they filter everything for what they think your pre-existing taste is and that makes it a lot harder but by the same token um social media and stuff like twitter takes people who were always kind of kept out of me they were always kept out of media and it lets them make noise and for that I, I love social media even though i'm i periodically uh, have hate have hate for my twitter and like go off right. of it we all do we, we all <laughs> not your that, twitter our own yeah, that, yeah no, we all hate uh, your twitter Molly, of course uh, yeah, with, yeah. I, I know the world does um but i will always kind of love twitter love twitter for that because twitter takes things and they don't have to go through like a fucking network executive they don't right. have to be filtered down and it makes them impossible to ignore yeah, I mean, it's. It, I always say it's kind of the best times and worst times because y anyone can do anything and get, and have the same access to everybody as a billion dollar company does. Exactly. Yeah. But at the same time, anyone can do anything and has the same amount of access, so it's a little bit hard to get stuff curated a little bit. Yeah. You lived in a, a bunch of other countries as well, or spent time in them as well. Um, I've traveled a lot. I've the only place I. I mean, I spent like a month working in Paris and stuff. I don't think I've never like lived lived abroad properly, but I've traveled a ton. Did you ever watch TV when you were there? Um, what have I seen? I, I saw like pro Assad regime TV for a little bit in, That's um, weird. when I was in, uh, Domi's and what was that like? Um, there was a very heavily made up anchor, um, like a Fox news made up looking made up anchor lady who was talking about using uh, theater to keep kids from being terrorists. Theater? Theater. Okay. Um, which was, it was, it was, you know, and it was just playing in like a refugee's tent. I saw that. Um, I've seen like clips of like Musasalat, which are, um, those are uh, soap operas mm -hmm. uh, that often historical, though not, though certainly not always, um, that were made by either Egypt or Syria usually. Um, but I haven't, I haven't seen a ton, I have to say. Because that's always like when I travel, I mean, I go to a supermarket because it's just interesting. Yeah. And I'm always like, I flip the TV on and be like, what's airing here? And part of it is to see like what kind of thing they're showing there, but also see like what weird American things are exported. To yeah, see, like, yeah. What, they, what their view of us is. Oh, I remember when I was in England, there was this show. It was by this guy. He was um, a boxing champion. He was a British Asian boxing champion. And he was teaching violent young British men who had previous assault convictions how to channel their anger into boxing. Oh, weird. So this is like a reality show. Yeah, it was a reality kind of show. It was called Angry Young Men, I think. That sounds about right. Yeah, it's like a store brand name. Yeah, and it was just like all these young British guys 
getting who had gotten into stupid fights and were now learning to box. And I, there was a part of me that wondered about the wisdom of it. But right, right. <laughs> Take that anger and that violence and channel it into anger and violence for money. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, you your form was all wrong when you're beating people up. Right, you know, right. you put your back into it, man. You're wasting. Your, you could have made like a thousand bucks doing that, punching that guy. Yeah. Uh, I but I haven't seen like tons tons of it though. Do you know what I did see? Because it was on the internet. Do you remember after uh, Fox had that hilarious no go zone thing with Paris? Yes. Yeah. And do you remember when the Parisian show did the parody of it where they yeah. had the guys dressed up as Fox guys? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's it's funny how I, you hear for a lot from like the Fox type people like the whole world gets our media and they all want to be us. And it's not the case at all. Yeah, the whole world, the whole world does get the media and they often mock it. <laughs> yeah, they don't. I mean, you know, when I, I lived in England for a while and yeah, they'd get like friends and it'd be on at like 10 o'clock at night and people, you know, but it wasn't. They they act like everyone goes to the latest Stallone movie and they wear their blue jeans and their. I'm like that is you need to get a passport because you've never been anywhere outside the U.S. Yeah, and it's always strange, unexpected things. I remember I was in Havana and they had a movie theater that was playing like The Dark Knight Returns. And oh, I was weird. I was like, that's strange. How did it even get there? I don't. I have no idea. How? So when were you in Havana? I was in Havana in uh, 2013. Okay, was that for an, an article or were you? I, were you there for... I was there for vacation. Vacation. Yeah, okay, yes. I was there yes, in yeah. for vacation. Um, it, that must have been like a very strange world because isn't it like stepping back in time a little bit? Oh, God. It's so beautiful there. Um, so beautiful. Yeah, it's all the old cars, the old crumbling buildings. I mean, just a staggeringly beautiful place. And people, people are so fucking smart there. Yeah. I... I mean, I, I loved it. You know, Havana is a, a great city, and I felt very, very grateful to be there. Um, yeah, it was wonderful. Is there any animation stuff you used to watch? I know a lot of sort of illustrators, I know now comic book people, tended to like really gravitate towards cartoons as kids. Um, no, I don't. I, 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 I haven't. I, I, I know that... I know that probably sounds blasphemous. Like, since I, I do some stop-motion animation, that I ought to watch the art form more. But I... You know, I really... I have, like, a very nerdy and... Per- I have like a very nerdy and particular taste in the media that I consume and right. I tend to like consume Oh god. Yeah, I just like I'm a fucking I'm a fucking weirdo and like a cultural illiterate in so many ways, but then like very very specialized in some things. Well, it's not like your prince where you only uh, consume the media you produce or anything. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> I only listen to my own music. <sighs> yeah, I mean I I um I imagine that you've had people approach you and be like, we want to make an animated series out of this illustration or, you know. Uh, yeah, and uh, then uh, I'm like, do you know how much work goes into an animation? Yeah. And they're like, how about this? You do all this work for us. And, and I'm like, I, I want to have hands that function. Right, right. Yeah, because you're just, you know, it's not something you'd want to watch. But did you ever watch like the Brothers Quay and that kind of no. weird? Oh, you'd love the Brothers Quay, actually. Oh, man. It's I, not I, a TV show. It's like they, they these weird stop motion animation that like the tool videos, if you remember those, oh, were very dude. influenced by. Like, no, I've heard about them. Like, I, you know i honestly like this this is what i do to give you an idea of like my nerdery yeah every morning i wake up and translate uh from arabic into english very painfully because not very good at arabic uh the uh literary essays of nizar kabani <laughs> and that's what that's, just because you you enjoy it yeah because i enjoy it i mean i think it's i think it's really fun but i also recognize that um perhaps that's a unique taste it's very specific yeah, yeah it's that's very, not it's very most specific. people probably when did you get an interest in doing language stuff um well i i studied arabic when i was in college like i took night courses in it and yep. but i failed like the, the language is really hard yeah and it's really different it's really beautiful and intellectual but really hard and i just like kicked my ass then and in part because i didn't have anyone to practice with but now what's really cool is that so Arabic has a thing that's called dysglossia, mm-hmm. which means that the spoken language that people speak in their house is completely and often like incomprehensible to the official written language. Because it's dialect, which Chinese has that as well. Like exactly. Yeah, Mandarin and Cantonese and so yeah. Exactly. So before the internet or before, you know, a lot of people who spoke Arabic as a first language were on social media, like if you were studying modern standard Arabic, like you wouldn't even use it. I mean, maybe you could like read Naqib Mahfouz. So I, it kicked my ass. I didn't try it for 10 years. And then in January, I started again. But now there's WhatsApp and Facebook and right. Twitter, and you can like totally use your modern standard Arabic all the time. Like it's right. actually super useful, especially you know with what I do, and um, I I love it so much. It it's probably been the thing that kept me sane this year was like really hard studying Arabic hard. 
And um, Naguib Mahfouz is really cool because he's like uh, Pablo Neruda of Syria because he's both um, like really erotic and sexy, but he's also really revolutionary and angry. Right, right. So I, I love translating his stuff and there isn't much of it in English. And I, my translations are like kind of crap, but they're, they, they please me. But you feel like you're accomplishing something. Yeah, exactly. Too. I imagine if you're, if you're doing th- stuff like that to sort of relax yeah. and occupy your brain, it's, it's, there's more of a sense of satisfaction than if you like sat down and watched an hour of like Real Housewives or something. Yeah, exactly. And I, I mean, so that's, that's what I do for fun. I'm a really big nerd. I, 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 I wish I had like more. <laughs> is there anything you, is there anything you like? collect or that you still like from when you were a teenager or childhood or like a like a almost guilty pleasure or like a a band that you'll still buy their records even though you know they're no good <laughs> or like i mean i don't i don't believe that there's like a guilty pleasure with music i mean if if art gives you pleasure then why should you feel right, guilty for right, it right in terms of i mean i i still love kurt cobain and courtney love and and you know i loved them when i was like a little angry 12 year old kid but i right. think they're fucking awesome like i don't feel guilty about it yeah 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 Oh, did you see the new documentary? I didn't know. I, I wouldn't recommend it if you enjoyed it. Was it that. grim? It's grim. It, it does really lay the uh, the case that she was involved in the uh, in the death. It's pretty it's pretty grim, um, but interesting, interesting. So I know you got a you got a um, another thing to do. So I'll wrap up. But it, is there a show or a movie or a book or anything that you feel like sort of captures New York well? Because it's so much on television and movies and media. oh god i'm gonna actually recommend this is a book that is about new york and i fucking love it even though it's about new york a hundred years ago but i think it totally gets like sort of fucked up mercenary jagged spirit of our city which is uh by luke sant and that's low life the lures and snares of old new york okay which is all about new york in the 19th century but only the criminal parts right and it's different from Gangs of New York that people probably have seen. Yeah, no, it's so much better than Gangs of New York. It's yeah. Well, it's not just about like the gangs. It's also about like Tammany Hall and the corrupt cops and right. you know, political machines. It's about everything. It's so good. Did you watch... Oh, you wouldn't You wouldn't have seen Boardwalk Empire because you haven't watched TV. I've, I've, watched, I've watched clips of it. I saw Paz de la Huerta coming out of a cake and she looked really pretty. Right, right. Um, and I, I... But I haven't like ever seen more than like a one minute clip of it right so you wouldn't if someone was like molly we want you to write uh, a, a television adaption of of the 19th century new york would that be something you'd be interested in i mean would... i would love to but i feel like i wouldn't be good at it because i don't know the art form enough i really right. believe that if you want to make art about if you want to make art like you should be a fan of that art form right. first and um while i'd be like totally you know i mean i'd love to be asked i don't feel like i have you know the, the, been involved in it enough yeah the cultural sort of language the exactly you know, exactly or even like the technical language of be of doing script writing i mean i feel like i wouldn't be good at it what if someone was like what if what would we do like an anthony bourdain style travel show where you know your vice was who has a deal with hbo was like let's do a show where you, you know you go to havana you go to the middle east i mean i think it'd be really cool except as i'm sure you know because you've you've been on camera so much it's so strange being on camera, man. Like you oh, have to yeah. walk through doors five times. It's like so, it's so artificial. Every time that someone like films a documentary on me or something, I, I'm reminded of this because I always think like, oh, it'd be so cool to do an Anthony Bourdain type right. show. And then like every single time I'm there, like it's like six hours in, and I'm going through that door again. <laughs> oh yeah, it's 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 not a documentary, yeah. even though it is. Like I just interviewed this amazing person. Be like, we're gonna do it from the other angle and be like, but we did the interview. How are we gonna like? We'll just take it again. It's like it's not a what. So, so while I think that I would I would love it, there's also a part of me that knows my my true hermit nature. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and all your arts that you sort of pursue are very individual. Yeah. You're exactly. Writing and drawing, and, you, and it's all you. Exactly. Yeah. But I mean, like, mad respect for people who do who do it right. And maybe some maybe someday I'll end up doing it, and then my twitchy awkwardness can be immortalized. No, as uh, as someone who shares that as well, it is it is difficult to imagine working with an army of people to make an art. <laughs> Thank you so much for doing this. It was great to talk to you. And uh, this was awesome. Thank you so excellent. much. You're very welcome. <laughs> There you go. 
Holy crap, Apple. I wasn't lying. Fascinating, smart, interesting person. Thank you for listening to the show here. Uh, if you have not ever heard my show before and you are listening because you are a Molly Crabapple fan, that is the more likely scenario than people who are listening to my show who have not heard of Molly Crabapple. Uh, welcome. I hope you enjoyed the show. I do a new episode every Wednesday. This one sort of broke format a little bit as Molly hasn't watched TV in about 16 years. But the show in in concept is I am a, I'm a stand-up comedian by trade. I pick a TV guide from my vast collection of TV guides. Somebody sits down, looks through that week in television, and we talk about what they would watch that week. Uh, we did have a stack of TV guides uh, sitting on the couch with me and Molly. We just we just didn't get to them due to time. But it's a fun show. I managed to get a lot of great, interesting people on the show. And if you like today's show, I think you'll like uh all of our shows and new episodes come out every Wednesday this month. We're having some bonus episodes. So that's why you're getting this one today. If you like the show or you don't like the show, you for some reason are still listening and, and either way you want to contact me, you can email me at TV guidance counselor at gmail.com or at can at I can read.com. You can go on our Facebook page, just search TV guidance counselor. We have a lot of fun discussions on there. You can tweet to me at TV guidance and I love hearing from you guys. So rate review the show on iTunes or anywhere you get it. And we'll see you again Wednesday for a a brand new episode of TV Guidance Counselor. I just didn't know how to make words and speak to other humans. After the iron lung time, then they cut off your leg.